wilderness within you. The 15th day of Lent, which is the Wednesday of week three. And our reading today is from Luke 10, verses 25 to 29, and I'm reading from the New International Version. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? We hang out the washing together. I've been waiting ages for the weather to brighten up. The wind these last weeks has brought squall after squall off the sea, with rain spattering against the window panes until I've been sick of hearing it. But at last the clouds have cleared enough to let the sun shine through, and this day the air shines gloriously clean, the wind still blowing. Obviously my cue to get on with the family's laundry, which has been stacking up waiting. Now, I have a method when I peg up the clothes, and glancing over, I'm not at all sure that Jesus has. But hey, they're flapping in the breeze and he's helping. That's okay, isn't it? Doing chores together is an excellent way to get to know someone. It can be easier to chat when you're both engaged in a task and the silences that arrive are easy and natural without anyone needing to fill them for the sake of politeness like you do at a party. Plus somehow, when I'm busy, it wakes up my mind and all kinds of thoughts come bustling in I didn't even know you were waiting at the door. My neighbour. This is one of the thoughts that have evidently been waiting out in the cold. How can I tell who is my neighbour? I mean, every time I turn on the computer, I'm bombarded with all these images. The day before yesterday, a photo of a child stopped me in my tracks she was squatting by a dusty road with her head dropped in her hands, thin, naked, enveloped in despair. The advert offered me the chance to help a child like her, implying there are millions. But I wanted to help her, actually her even though I only have £20 in my current account. I wanted to pick her up and bring her home. But I can't, can I? My heart tells me she is my neighbour. My common sense and my knowledge of geography tell me she is as unreachable as the moon. Setting up another monthly direct debit to a missionary organisation doesn't feel a bit like helping my neighbour. What do you think? What should I have done? And there was another child, a poor scrap of a thing in a cot in some institution in Eastern Europe. Thousands like these. Waiting for adoption, the article said. Adoption? I don't think so. Not at my age. But that was only the beginning of it. 
After that came the picture of a sad dog and a caption urging me to offer a home to a gentle greyhound and one reminding me how little it costs to save the sight of someone in Africa or India who without my help will be completely blind. And the pictures of refugees emerging barefoot along the track through clouds of blowing dust, gaunt and tired, carrying their worldly goods in cloth bundles on their heads. All of them, apparently, need my help. I don't know where to start. I can't see how to begin. And then I met Elaine on the bus and she'd been so poorly She's nearly 90 now and she feels so vulnerable at times. She had bronchitis and phoned the emergency doctor because she felt so ill it scared her. Guess what they told her? Go to the hospital and see the emergency doctor there. So she had a 15 minute walk to the bus stop, a 20 minute wait for the hospital bus and a 45 minute wait in a hospital waiting room. By then it was late and she still had to get back home. Elaine needs a neighbour. And I heard Raymond has gone into a home now because his macular degeneration has got so bad there's nothing right in front of him but a blank space. He could really do with a visitor right now. And then last night a woman passing in the street screamed at her kids so loudly it made me wince. But I know that woman. She looks so tired sometimes. She hardly ever gets out. And I think it's been hard to make the money stretch since her husband left. And I know she's frightened of losing the house if they can't keep up the payments. So many people who need so much, so little of me, which one do I pick? Where do I begin? I've stopped what I was doing and stand waving my hands in the air helplessly, illustrating point after point with wild and impotent gestures. He doesn't reply. He doesn't look at me. He just gets on with the job. One item of laundry at a time, in no particular order, just as they present themselves on the pile. He picks them up, shakes them out, and hangs them in the sunshine and fresh air. What seemed like a European washing mountain now blows gaily in the breeze, firmly anchored by pegs that he's picked up from the basket, one by one. Later that day, before the evening damps, I come out into the garden again, take it all down, fold it up and bring it indoors. Next week there'll be the same load to do all over again, and the week after that. The ordinary rhythm of service, the mundane tasks of responsibility, the unexceptional face of love. Week by week, day by day, one by one.